Materians and guests. Unlike uh, unlike Carol, our guest speaker today doesn't ride a bike. In fact, he travels everywhere. I'm fair to say, probably at the pointy end of the plane. Mel Simpson, born, raised, and educated here in Adelaide, spent 25 years in the international airline industry, including time with uh, Qantas, four years with Qantas up in Sydney followed by senior management positions with Cathay Pacific, Continental Airlines and Northwest Airlines. These days, he is the CEO of the Champion Group, which he set up 20 years ago, back in 1994. It operates Champion Travel, Champion Event Management, and Champion Sports, which distributes gold products Australia-wide, including Yes Putters and, um, and Bushnell Range Finders. Mel's had a long involvement in basketball as a player, coach and administrator and in fact was chairman of the Adelaide 36ers for 14 years from 84 until 98. Married to Julie with three children, as said, is now the CEO and the director of the Champion Group here in Adelaide. And to talk, a great talk you'll enjoy along with the audio-visual presentation on the history of Australian aviation. Please make welcome Rotarians and guests. Our guest for today, Mel Simpson, to join us. Uh, thank you very much, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here today. Thank you for the, uh, the invitation. Um, I joined Qantas here at Adelaide in 1968, and I've had uh, 46 years in the airline and the tourism industry. Um, don't quite know how I got to be that much, but here I am, uh, 46 years later. Um, I'm talking to you today about uh, aviation, a century of remarkable change. And, uh, 25 minutes ago through 110 years of aviation isn't a long time, but we'll try and cover as much of it as we possibly can, starting with the, the basic design of how an aircraft flies. Now, I'm sure many of you do, that do understand the, the theory of flight, but some of you may not. Quite simple, really. Our pioneers uh, observed birds in flight and deducted that uh, that shape when the, uh, the air passes over the wing and under it, the air on top has to travel further than the air underneath, and that creates a low pressure on top of the wing um, and creates a lift. The faster you go, the more difference there is between that high pressure and low pressure. <coughs> uh, to aid the aircraft taking off and landing, they of course have added uh, flaps up the front on the leading edge of the wing and at the rear of the wing, which gives even more of a curve and allows the aircraft to fly at slower speeds uh, without stalling, which greatly uh, aids the you know, ability to, to land, obviously. So that's the theory of flight, and remarkably our pioneers uh, were able to work that out uh, over 110 years ago. Now, there was some flight, obviously, in the very early days with the uh, hot air balloons. Um, they were obviously remarkable at the time and uh, created a tremendous public interest, uh, but they weren't power flight. In fact, balloons, as we all know, are still really popular today. There are also lots of non-powered gliders that were taking advantage of the understanding of the wing design. But it was in 110 years ago, or so we're told, December 17th, 1903, that the Two Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, owners of a bicycle shop, were supposedly the first humans on earth to uh, supposedly the first humans on earth to launch a powered flying machine at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. That aircraft is actually on display today in the Smithsonian Aviation Museum in Washington D.C. It flew for uh, only a few seconds, for about 100 feet, but it flew. Um, now, 110 years is only really a pencil dot in the history of mankind, but wow, how flying has changed since. 
So today, we have the, the Airbus A380. Uh, flies for some 15,000 kilometres, 16 hours, 525 passengers uh, in a fair amount of luxury. And I'll guarantee there's a number of people in the room here right now that have flown on the A380 already. Both have flown? <laughs> a fair number. But uh, were the Wright brothers the first to fly? In actual fact, just as Columbus did not really discover America and Captain Cook did not really discover Australia, history is wrong, and I'll get to that shortly. However, the first flight in Australia was actually made by Harry Houdini. That's what the history tells us. Um, 18th of March, 1910 at Diggers Rest in Melbourne. Also wrong. The first person to fly in Australia was here in South Australia, a gentleman called Frederick Customs who flew the day before Harry Houdini. In actual fact, Houdini was supposed to come to Adelaide and, and fly that aircraft, but he was uh, ill and unable to make the trip to Adelaide. So Frederick Custance, who was heavily involved in the building of the aircraft, flew it himself one day before Houdini. So first flight in Australia, here in Adelaide at Bolivar. Um, but uh, Customs actually also had the, uh, flew in World War I as a pilot, uh, had the first caterpillar Tractor Agency in South Australia and died in 1922, still very young, when his car broke down in the desert. However, our, our good friends and neighbours in New Zealand lay claim to the first flight in the world. Uh, Richard Pierce at uh, Waitoe near Timaru on the South Island, 31st of March 1903, six months before the Wright brothers. Unfortunately, the Kiwis wrong again. Now, recently it's been established beyond doubt, without question, that Gustav Whitehead, a German-American, flew on the 18th of August 1901 at Fairfield near Bridgeport, Connecticut, two years before the Wright brothers. But unfortunately, for some reason, even though it was reported widely in the newspapers at the time, he's never received the long-standing credit uh, for that event. Um, flight then developed very, very quickly. Um, and all sorts of uh, different designs, uh, whatever, were come up with, but of course, flying was never without incident. Uh, as the, thing, uh, the uh, title says, flying itself is not inherently dangerous, but it can be very unforgiving. If you have a close look, you can see the pilot's actually still in the aircraft. <laughs> uh, he's got his hands on the wing, so he's obviously still alive. And also, there's some people climbing up the tree. Well, I, I think they're climbing up, but maybe they're climbing down. But, uh, <laughs> uh, progress then continued uh, further for several years until, until World War I. And we, like most wars, it brings a surge of uh, technological development. And uh, governments then realised that uh, flying was more than a novelty. It actually had some very practical uses, uh, obviously initially for reconnaissance and photography, which allowed them to know exactly where the uh, enemy's uh, troops and lines were and could act, then help them in their offensive planning to counterattack that. They then realised that, that uh, if you carried a gun, you could also shoot the pilot and the plane from the opposition. That became fairly popular. Uh, and, and then it eventually led to a more sophisticated weaponry. They also uh, realised that uh, he could uh, drop bombs, and this is serious. This is how they first dropped the bombs from the aircraft in World War One. They had them in the aircraft with them, simply picked them up, hung them over the edge and dropped them. They actually were quite accurate, Bob. This actually would be. Um, but then again, they had their guns mounted on the front of the, uh, the aircraft, just by the propeller, and fired forward so it was better to fire. It fired through the propeller. Um, the guns were synchronised with the pistons of the aircraft, so that it would fire through the propeller without, obviously, damaging the propeller. So it, it's in itself is quite a remarkable achievement for something in 1915, 1916, to actually have that synchronisation that allowed the aircraft not to uh, shoot its own propeller off. Um, the other thing was that communications were very, very poor. And in order to get the information back to, head on, to the headquarters as soon as they possibly could, they literally, Use carrier pigeons. Now, 
Trump, 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 Trump. <laughs> but we talk about Israel in a familiar human. But they carried a, um, carried a piece in the little uh, cages within the cockpit. If they saw something, they saw it had never been reported. They would write it on a note, attach it to the pigeon's legs, and let it loose, and it would fly back and deliver the information. And that's quite true, quite serious. After uh, World War II, there were so many thousands of people that had been trying, trained as engineers, as uh, pilots, and etc. that they came back into the workforce, and obviously a lot of them were really, really in love with uh, flying. And so flight developed dramatically again once the war had finished. Aviation was really, in a sense, taken to the people. Um, and if you recall, uh, at that time there were barnstorming air shows that were operating throughout the USA and throughout Australia. They'd land in a small country town and offer free uh, sort of flights to the local, joy flights to the local village, uh, villages for a you know, 10 cent or shilling a head or whatever. So uh, <coughs> very, very quickly, they saw the commercial applications of aviation. Um, the, the development of the aircraft continued, um, and you'll see this uh, next aircraft is actually uh, the Vickers Vimy bomber that the Smith brothers flew from London to Adelaide. It took 28 days to get here, and the aircraft, of course, is on display at Adelaide Airport. Has been for some, you know, 70 years or more. And Ross Smith, uh, I know that his statue is actually in the Creswell Gardens at the front of the Oval here has been for many, many, many years. But the uh, civil aviation was truly born at that time. Um, the oldest airline in the world is actually KLM, the Dutch airline. That was incorporated in 1919, but it didn't fly for some couple of years afterwards. The oldest aircraft in the world that actually began operations is Qantas. Qantas started flying in 1921. Uh, up in uh, Long Reach in Queensland by uh, uh, Hudson Fish. And they was essentially started as an uh, airline to deliver mail through the outback of, uh, of Queensland. Qantas standing for Qantas, uh, sorry, Queensland and Northern Territory Area Service. Um, Hudson Fish, which is the next photograph on the top right hand side, um, he later became the general manager and uh, see, uh, sorry, chairman of Qantas in its uh, uh, days of jet operation or whatever. And when I joined Qantas in 68, he was still the chairman uh, of, of, uh, of Qantas. Um, prior to air travel, travel was <laughs> by train and boat and whatever. And, uh, that's actually first class on Indian Railway. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get the chance, you knock our economy class. Uh, also uh, by ship, um, and of course the, the ships were essentially liners in those days, flying, sorry, travelling, sailing point to point, uh, particularly across the, the Atlantic, but again, uh, very slow. <coughs> so aircraft became a really attractive option, and initially it uh, was done through, uh, through flying boats. So the most famous of them is probably the Pan Am Clipper, or that one, I think it's called the China Clipper. In those days, uh, everywhere had water, everywhere had harbours, so it was easy to find somewhere for these aircraft to land, as opposed to the very expensive exercise of, uh, of building an airport. But um, the Clipper service uh, was extremely popular. In Sydney, it operated out of Rose Bay. Um, that was the major airport in Sydney. At that time, Mascot was still swamped uh, and had not begun operating at all. Um, but the, pla the the, the aircraft themselves, um, primarily the Sunderland the flying boat, uh, were extremely comfortable. They were quite spacious, two levels, and uh, they really were a, a, a really popular way for people to travel. To fly from Australia to London on the Kangaroo route at that time <coughs> took about 12 days, because they didn't have the luxury of having crews placed at every port to take over from the crew that had to rest. So uh, it went overnight the way to London, the likes of Singapore, Calcutta, Karachi, Tripoli, and Qantas and BOAC would, would change in Calcutta and then fly back to their home ports. BOAC being British Overseas Airways Corporation, which uh, then became British Airways. Um, Air New Zealand 
in those days. They also had flying boats and they were called TEAL, T-E-A-L, Trans Empire Airways Limited. And that's not that long ago. They were TEAL in the, in the mid-60s, I'm sure. Um, World War II saw another massive development in aircraft because up until World War II, from World War I, they'd gone into big sort of bombers or whatever, but the, the main aircraft the military were using was still primarily Tiger Moths. It was only really the development of World War II and the power that was coming that got them into looking at uh, moving ahead from that kind of Tiger Moth aircraft. So um, by the end of the war, you saw the introduction of the large uh, four-engine bombers. <coughs> and of course, history's been made by the uh, bombers like the Lancaster, the Boeing B-17, the Bristol, the Halifax, who've all pretty much become folklore. I saw a program only recently uh, which starred Ewan McGregor, the actor, and his brother who was an Air Force pilot, and they're actually flying in the only Lancaster bomber still flying in England today. But the fighters uh, that they uh, developed for and had available for the Battle of Britain, which were the uh, Spitfire primarily, as the war progressed, those those fighter planes they were able to extend their range quite dramatically and by the end of the war they could actually get to Berlin and return. So the bombers could be protected from England all the way to the major, the major cities in Germany um, and, and return and that dramatically dropped the losses that they uh, uh, received and of course as you're all aware uh, the bombing was relentless, uh, particularly towards the end, day, day end and night, every day and every night and it completely, totally decimated Germany. The jet engine uh, was developed prior to the war, but it took a lot of uh, uh, red tape and uh, bureaucratic uh, mishandling uh, before the aircraft were actually, actually able to fly. And both the Brits and the Germans developed uh, jets. The Germans flew theirs during World War II, uh, which was the Messerschmitt ME 262 Schwal, uh, which, uh, excuse me if my German's not very good, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's uh, German for swallow. But the mission has been flew quite uh, significantly at the latter stages of the war, but the war was pretty much over before it really had the chance to do so. Had it been introduced a little earlier, it may have had a much bigger impact. Uh, it uh, certainly uh, caused uh, the existing British fighters a lot of problems. The English also had a, uh, a jet fighter called the Closter Meteor, but that really was never introduced until after the war was completed, developed uh, by Sir Frank Whittle, who really was instrumental in the development of the jet engine. Um, <coughs> towards the end of the war, um, the British, uh, sorry, the Americans developed the Boeing uh, B-29. Now that was a massive aircraft for its time. It flew for many, many years following World War II. It is, of course, the aircraft type that was used uh, was in mainly the Pacific and it was used to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The Americans eventually were able to take control of the Guam uh, Islands <coughs> and uh, close to Guam is Saipan, uh, where were very, very serious, uh, massive battles that took place on Saipan before they got control. And only a few miles off the shores of Saipan is an island called Tinian, and that's the island that the uh, aircraft took off to. Uh, bomb Japan and the atomic bomb. Um, the captain of that flight was uh, Colonel Paul Tibbetts. Unlike common <coughs> rumour, he didn't commit suicide. He didn't uh, have severe mental problems. He lived to a ripe old age and flew um, old World War II aircraft for many, many years in what they refer to as the Confederate Air Force, which appears at lots of air shows and uh, flying shows, etc. Uh, the aircraft was named Anola Gay. Anola Gay because it was his mother's name. <coughs> so they named the aircraft Anola Gay after his mother, and that, of course, was before he realised he was going to be dropping the atomic bomb. Um, again, after World War II had finished, there were masses, masses of people, highly qualified engineers, technicians, pilots, navigators, etc., that uh, came back into the workforce. And again, many wanted to work in civil aviation, and many did. When I joined Qantas, 
in Sydney, sorry, in 1968 when we moved to Sydney in 69. Qantas was virtually dominated by ex Australian Air Force uh, captains and officers. And uh, it was, in those days, like much of our society, a very military run type operation. You know, you were required to wear a dark suit, you were required to wear a white shirt, you were not allowed to wear a loud tie. Um, I had a associate of mine, who's still a good friend of mine, uh, at the age of 19 was working at uh, um, Mascot Airport as a commercial trainee, like, as I was. He had sideburns that were down sort of halfway to his ear, uh, to his ear. He was sent home, uh, told to shave and have the sideburn taken up to the top of his ear. Can you imagine telling a young 19 year old that today? <laughs> <coughs> I can imagine the response and the language that would be used. <coughs> Uh, as a 21 year old working in Sydney in 1970, I was a charter planning officer and my job was to plan um, charters, which were really big business in those days. It was pre the 747 and it was pre all the promotional fares. Flying was still relatively expensive. So Qantas operated a lot of charters and they were essentially people living in Australia that were visiting friends and relatives back in the UK or Italy or whatever. That was very, very strong and they had uh, very strong migrant associations. And also there were a tremendous number of migrant charters into Australia. So my, my job was to plan, plan these charter flights and I had to check the availability of the aircraft to make sure we had an aircraft available to go, to make sure that we had a technical crew, pilots available, cabin crew, that we had engineering facilities available wherever the aircraft was going or transiting. Traffic services, they could handle the aircraft being loaded and unloaded catering uh, to get international flight clearances because you can't just fly an aircraft anywhere you want in the world without the government flying over knowing, landing approvals, etc. In fact, seriously, as a 21 year old, I had the authority to send a Qantas Boeing 707 to anywhere I wanted in the world. You know, naturally Qantas would have been pretty pissed off if it had got to say Istanbul and there was no crowd there, no passengers there for it to pick up. <laughs> but certainly, uh, myself and the people I worked with, the individual colleagues, had the ability to send the aircraft. Um, and you had to uh, look at a whole range of issues. Uh, you had to check if it was going to a place like Ankara, where Qantas never flew. You had to make sure that the runway width was wide enough. If the engines overhung the Asheville, then it would kick up all the stones and dirt and damage the aircraft. You had to, to, to check the takeoff weight that the runway strength could handle it. You had to check the temperature, the air temperature, uh, because that affected the density of the air. And uh, you know, obviously the, the takeoff weight is critically important that the aircraft has enough lift at its particular required speed to get into the air. <coughs> if it's overweight, it doesn't get into the air, does it? Um, so you had to check that there was equipment there, for example, a 707 couldn't start itself, so there had to be a ground power unit uh, available wherever you were flying to make sure they could restart the aircraft. Um, there were some real problems with it because uh, you know, they were taking charter flights out of all sorts of uh, unknown Qantas ports, Salonika, Ankara, in South America. And a lot of the people that were coming were really coming out of third world situations. They were not exposed to Western food, they were not exposed to Western toilets. And so consequently, uh, the flight cleaning requirements when it got back to Sydney was some, something short of a nightmare. <laughs> they were embarrassed not to eat the food, and so they would put it down between the seats. So when the tray got taken away, it would appear that they'd eaten the food. Just those sort of little situations that, that occurred. But it was a fantastic experience for me, and it taught me really how to uh, uh, an airline operated from top to bottom. And then following that, I was, uh, Tony said I worked at Cathay Pacific Continental and Northwest. Now, when I joined Qantas in Adelaide in 1968, they did not fly to Adelaide. <coughs> they were only international, and they had some 26 aircraft. <coughs> there were about 40 employees working for Qantas in Adelaide at the Adelaide office at number 14 King William Street, under the management of Captain John Solly. Today, uh, Qantas have amalgamated with TAA. They have 140 aircraft. <coughs> They've got another 60 aircraft on order. They fly domestically and internationally, and they have in Adelaide today a total of six employees. 
So how they can run a business in Adelaide with six employees is actually totally beyond me. But with the technology and the computerisation, that's what they and a lot of other big companies are starting to do. In 1968, when I joined Qantas, there were 22 airlines that had offices in Adelaide. Uh, none of them flew into Adelaide at all, apart from TAA and ANSET. Um, today, uh, in, 19, in 2014, there are seven airlines with offices in Adelaide. All reservations were done totally manually. There were no computers to utilise. <coughs> All reservations were taken by each city, like out of the Adelaide Corners office, from travel agents or whatever, and they would be sent by talent to uh, reservation control in Sydney, where they had a manual manifest for every flight for every day. So if I booked Mr and Mrs Pilkington on the flight from Sydney to, to uh, Honolulu on a particular date, in Sydney they would take my telex, they would go to the manifest for that flight on that day, and they would write their names on the manifest. <coughs> Here in Adelaide, in all reservation offices, the operator kept the reservations card that he would write on it and, and the, would copy to the telex of what he required. <coughs> if it became a long itinerary, then he would take another card to that one, and then another one, then another one. So sometimes the card would be 10 or 12 high, all folded up. They're all filed manually. So guess what? <coughs> I can't tell you how many times uh, they couldn't locate the file because it had been filed incorrectly, in the, under the wrong letter or the alphabet or whatever. And it would be absolute bedlam with the entire office going through and trying to locate their reservations card. Fortunately, there were nowhere near as many people flying as, uh, then as there are today. The PC was not invented until 1975. <coughs> Have I got myself out of cute or anything? No, I don't think so. Um, <coughs> I had. I was going to say quickly, the first commercial, go back one, the first commercial jet to ever fly was the Comet, uh, built by Vickers. Uh, quite famous, unfortunately became most famous for the fact that it crashed on a number of occasions. <laughs> if you look at the photograph, you can see that the windows are actually square. And that's what caused the aircraft to crash. Today, all the windows are oval shaped because it distributes the pressure equally. What happened with these aircraft, under a num after a number of hours of pressurisation and depressurisation, it would develop cracks in the corners of the square window. So then when the crack broke, it would uh, lead to sudden pressurisation and the aircraft would crash. <coughs> um, now, Nick, I've got myself lost here. Okay. <laughs> Go through to the PC. That was the telex machine manually. The next one, I plan to, it was about to talk about the PC. But the personal computer wasn't developed until 1975. I mean, you talk to kids today and they can't believe it. I mean, you haven't, you haven't had it for your entire life, no. 1975, and when it came out, it was called the Altair. And all it did was play pub squat. Do you remember, that's all it could do. It wasn't until a couple of years later, when Steve Jobs and uh, the Bill Gates of this world stuck a cathode ray tube screen to it and a keyboard that it actually began, began to be able to do things. Now bear in mind, its memory was pathetic. And you, those of you that had a PC in the early days was probably a Commodore. That's what the majority of them were. <coughs> However, then in 1972, the Boeing 747 arrived in Australia and that just changed everything. That's the Boeing 747-100. The corners actually didn't have it version of 200. Upstairs was the first class lounge. People in the first class would go upstairs and sit and have dinner and have a drink and whatever. That didn't last long. They soon realised they could put seats there and so <coughs> There was nine abreast seating in economy class. That didn't last long. They soon realised they could squeeze a tenth one in. Yeah. Yeah. And we've all suffered with it. It's <laughs> a lack of comfort ever since. So it now has ten. Uh, but it came in in 1971 and uh, charters almost ceased, but promotional fares came in. <coughs> so suddenly you could fly to London for a fraction of the price that you could prior to 1971. <coughs> now what it did was, Australia started travelling in enormous numbers. You know, if I go around the room and ask you, I bet nearly everyone here has been to Singapore. I bet most of you have been to Hong Kong. I bet most of you have been to Thailand. And I bet Bali, and I bet a, I bet a number of you have been to Singapore on a number of occasions. 
because most Australians have. <clears throat> Australians are probably the most travelled nation on this planet. Then came the Concord. Absolutely outstanding. Believe it or not, it first flew in 1969. Now, people can't believe that it actually flew that long ago. It, it toured Australia in 1972. I, me I remember seeing it land at the, the airport in Sydney in 1972. Um, now, there were uh, the Concorde, which was never financially viable, never made any money. It was flown, flown for national prestige. The Americans had a much larger one called the SST, but it got canned by, by the Congress during the fuel crisis in 71 and was never completed. Um, I was lucky enough to fly on board the aircraft in 1997, and the actual flight that I happened to be on by fewer chance was a BG entourage, mm -hmm. and there were about 30 of them. Bear in mind, this was a first class plus surcharge airfare. So they had 30 people on, on that transatlantic. But it flew transatlantic in three hours. When you took off in London, you'd get to New York before you took off. So it, it obviously the people that were traveling a lot was incredibly popular. <clears throat> it was finally mothballed, uh, following the crash in Paris, 25 July 2000. Uh, and that was used as an excuse to mothball it because it was losing so much money anyway. From con uh, supersonic travel will never happen again commercially. They will go now to what they call hypersonic. And hypersonic is where the aircraft takes off, flies into space, and then will travel, say, Sydney, London, in space, land again, whole trip, maybe two hours. <coughs> now, they've already got some hypersonic aircraft, Food and uh, Galactic have got one, and they're planning to uh, do passenger flights into space. But just like the Tiger Moths of World War I, it's a very primitive aircraft, only carrying six passengers. But it's only a matter of time until they develop one that carries 100 or 150 or, or 200. Um, am I running out of time? <laughs> um, the uh, last one I'm just going to is uh, the black box, which may <coughs> bring on a, heat, uh, a series of questions. <coughs> As you can see, you probably know it's not actually black at all. <coughs> I don't know why they call it a black box. But the interesting thing is that it's made of material that's virtually indestructible. And no matter how serious the crash, they virtually always find the black box if they can locate the crash. Um, the interesting thing is if uh, it is so strong and uh, endurant, you know, endurable, indestructible, someone has asked the question, why don't they make the entire aircraft out of the same material? <laughs> but um, the other thing I don't understand is the technology today why the information that it's recording isn't being transmitted to a central point. Because um, they have all the technology to do that. And rather than record it on that and then spend hours and whatever trying to find it, it seems to me that it would have sent, like to back up your own computer. There is a Canadian office. company that is doing it now. Is that right? Yep. And yeah, they want to buy shares of them because everyone else is buying them. Someone <laughs> beat me to the idea. Yep. <laughs> um, I'll leave it there because um, I don't want to run over time. But uh, I'm certainly available to uh, ask any questions if you should have any. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, we do have a little video that uh, we can show you. It takes a couple of minutes. If you're interested? That uh, hopefully won't put you offline. But does show you some rather awkward landings. Bear in mind, even though you might see this. The most dangerous part of flying today is still the drive here.
film didn't tell you is that what you've just seen is a new commercial for Australian National Railways that will uh, take away over the next, uh, next couple of days. So, if you will, please thank Mel Simpson. Thank you.